So greetings to all. This is Vaibhav Agarwal, and today we have Colonel Anil Ved with us, who comes from the Eighth Mahar and the first company commander on the Sri Lankan soil during the IPKF operations. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, sir. Thank you so much for your time and the contributions and the inputs that you're going to make today. And uh, that brings up the first question: Since your battalion was the first the first troops that entered Sri Lanka. During the IPKF operations, how and what were the circumstances then, and what were the initial steps that you all took? I am warning uh, and thank you very much, Rabbi, for uh, this kind invitation, and of course, getting those uh, memories back, which are well entrenched in the CPU. Uh, right. Sorry uh, to start with. Uh, I am uh, currently overseas, so I don't have all those uh, aids with which I can tell you and explain you. But yes, based on my memory, I'll certainly explain you what exactly it is. Sure. So you, as per your question of our, uh, yes, I'm from Eight Mahar and our battalion was the first one. And it happens to be, and I happens to be the first, rather fortunate with the first wave of the aircraft which landed there, along with uh, my company. Actually, if you go uh, for the operations, I just take, slightly uh, slightly away and uh, you've got to go in a little bit of history as uh, of course General Jones has very uh, has explained it in great details uh, not, not, nothing much left to explain further but uh, you know uh, after in 1948 when uh, Sri Lanka got its uh, independence and of course the Citizenship Act and all those things were introduced uh, gradually over the coming uh, following decades uh, the status of this uh, Tamils, uh, you know, diaspora started uh, going down to the second rate citizens. And of course, they were not getting their uh, rights. Leave, uh, basics, of course, uh, are there, but they're so called, in spite of the merit based community, you know, they, they, of course, they were uh, holding very good uh, positions and gradually it was, uh, they were reduced. And thing, one thing led to another uh, till there were the riots in early 70s in Colombo, in which almost about 3,000 Tamils uh, died, as for the reports. So that was the so-called turning point of this ethnic conflict. And that is how the youngsters, they started, uh, took the path of militancy, and uh, there were seven groups of the parties, small parties. Uh, they were formed at the India, India, PPR, LF, Plot and the uh, LGT, uh, so uh, Telo, Telo and Plot were uh, the most powerful parties uh, to okay. start with, right? So and they they had a very good domination, but what happens is uh, the area, you know, it's almost thirty three percent of the land mass in Sri Lanka is uh, northeast, is held almost by about ninety to twenty percent of the uh, Tamil population. So they were quite uh, spread out and uh, resulting in uh, that type of impact they were making it, but in small pockets. And it disturbed, of course, it, they were able to cut off uh, northeast from the mainland. And uh, things led to another till Prabhakaran uh, stepped in and he, uh, this war of domination started and he started eliminating the smaller groups, a couple of them joined hands with his party and uh, they went into it and the balance he was uh, able to annihilate everyone there. So virtually by uh, late 70s or 80, early 80, he had a complete uh, domination of the Northeast, right? And uh, complete when I mean to say it's almost about 90% of uh, the area was well within his control and these small uh, subgroups uh, were in isolation or in hiding somewhere. So that was one. Two is 83, if you remember, the first strike done by the Prabhakans were when they shot dead the mayor of Jaffa. Right. Now that is how the entire problem started and it took the military angle. So they, this was the first strike when they did and took the revenge. Uh, and that is how the military intervention of the Sri Lankan army was, and the LGT started. And of course, uh, it led to where, you know, the mass exodus of uh, Tamil diaspora to Tamil Nadu and a stage came when uh, uh, we had a lot of influx and uh, the central government at that particular time in Delhi, uh, the Congress government under Rajiv Gandhi, uh, 
uh, they didn't have much of uh, their footprints in the southern states of India. So this was more of a political uh, move also. Right. And MGR, MGR, who was very powerful the leader, of course, of the Tamils, uh, you know, and uh, the ethnic uh, relationship between the Indian uh, Tamils and the Sri Lankan Tamils goes back to almost, you know, the day of the plantations, days of British days, you know. So uh, that probably put a lot of pressure for us to step in. Uh, now, uh, the preparation part of it, it was a slightly hasty decision. Of course, you know, in hindsight, you can always find flaws in any accord or any agreements. Okay. It happens. Like if you go back to Longawala uh, Accord or you go to the Bodo Land or to the Sam Accord, you can find drawbacks. I mean, it's, uh, nothing is perfect. You, you cannot, never, never perfect. History is full of such, uh, you know, uh, uh, examples. So mm -hmm. this accord, of course, also was signed. And there are major five odd clauses in the India Sri Lanka Accord, which uh, Sir Joseph explained. And um, the political compulsions and the pressure on Jayavadhan. Jayavadhan, he realized, you know, he was a smart guy, like God bless his soul. Uh, he realized that militarily he can't do. Someone has to do the dirty work. And he found a sort of window of opportunity, you know. He's, and uh, the other pressures, regional pressures, you know, outside pressures came up and uh, he very nearly agreed. But no, not before June 87. It was when we made those... Uh, the Indian Air Force went in for the food dropping. That was the first signal to the Sri Lankans, you government, that, uh, you know, you step in like we are coming. You like it or not. So if we get in, this was going to be. So that was the first signal. So they realized. And then, of course, the next stage of accord and all uh, got into play. So that is the time we were just back from Rastas. In the month of April '87, we just got back after six, seven months in wherever we were. Uh, we got back to our main position in Secunderabad, and uh, we knew something in the offing, but of course, we didn't know that it was going to be Sri Lanka. There's something, something. So, uh, you know, we were started training for certain type of operations, but at ground level, we had no clue whatsoever what is the impending task. Uh, sometimes in the month of uh, yeah, July 87, mid-July, we were told that we are going to go to Sri Lanka and going in for a military intervention. We were given our military objectives. So that is how our formation, that is the 91 Brigade, which was there, we were prepared and we, 23rd of July 87, we left. Uh, our main position, we went to Tiruchirappalli and we started preparing our heli loads because we have to go. And we were told it's a similar like an operation which is going, I was given an objective. So were the other company commanders given a certain objectives uh, to take on. And uh, it was uh, based on a heliborn operation. Okay. Uh, come 29th of July, so night, we were at the Rusharapalli airstrip waiting for the helicopters to come. Uh, you know, amount of uh, choppers uh, and go for the work, but uh, mid somewhere in the middle of uh, night, and right, we were still at the airport or the airstrip. Uh, we were told that no, the role is now change is going to be peacekeeping mode and not the military operations. Right. Now, just think of it. We were self-contained only for seventy-two hours in terms of food and ammunition. So when I say 72 hours, means we were just man-packed with us, rucksacks. Nothing more, nothing less. And uh, instead of the helicopters, only change was the fixed-wing aircraft standard. Early morning at about 3.30 and we took off. So that was the first wave which landed. And uh, I, along with uh, Captain Anil Mathur and uh, Lieutenant Satyamita Singh, who to get it later, uh, we were the three officers and we went in. We landed. Uh, Mathur straight away took his men and we took control of the ATC as we landed. And we spread out, of course, we uh, were all ready to take on any situation uh, coming from the Sri Lankan army. But uh, after seven, eight minutes when we spread out and we took positions all around and secured the airstrip for the uh, following waves to land, you know, found, we found nothing. Only a lone gypsy came with a Sri Lankan officer. He says, some tea is ready for you guys. So it was 
sort of, you know, uh, uh, different scenario. Of course, uh, we took over the uh, Palali airfield and the buildup started. And by evening, there was a major buildup. Uh, and then we stayed in Palali for about the two days. Uh, we had nothing to eat because the uh, shakar paras, which were uh, to cater uh, for a hunger for 72 hours, finished in 24 hours. And uh, there were no rations, uh, no cooking utensils. So the first uh, 48 hours, uh, the entire troops were uh, without uh, grain. Starting with officers, J.S. Yeah, 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 we remain hungry. And then we tried to uh, arrange some food from the Sri Lankans, but they were also, you know, uh, <laughs> as good or as bad as state like us. So it was, uh, we had two Tamil speaking officers, Major Swami and uh, Captain Jairaj and Self. We told the Sri Lankans that we are stepping out Palali airfield. Uh, so he says, no, you can't go. It's all uh, mine area. You know, hell with it. So three of us, we borrowed their cycles and we went out of Palali airfield. Barely we had gone about 400 meters that we encountered the first check post of the LDT. So they welcomed us like anything, like mm -hmm. long lost brothers. So that was the first uh, meeting with the LDT boys. You know, then he said, okay, guys, like uh, we don't have... Uh, we have, we would like to meet your uh, area commander or whosoever it is. So they took us another 10, 30, uh, 40 yards from there. There's a house and we met the leader. And we, of course, I didn't know Tamil, of course, but uh, Major Swami and uh, Jay, they knew the language very well. They were Tamil officers. We spoke and they said, okay. Uh, they said, okay, you give us one hour. We are, how, how many of you? So we were about 500 odd men plus. He says, okay, we'll cater for the rations, dry rations and utensils, but our truck, which will come in, you have to ensure that not, no harm is done by the Sri Lankan. Okay. He's not captured. He's not a right. That is done. With us. And rightly so, it didn't even take an hour. We found uh, a truck full of rations and we were at the uh, Kalali airfield. Now the Sri Lankans didn't want it. They were shit scared. They were, because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like this. They could come with explosive or anything can happen. We, we don't know, but they do it. So, um, and uh, Captain Miller's strike at uh, Point Pedro was very, very fresh in their mind. So, uh, the Russians came and uh, we, of course, we found that the certain Russians were having the Indian Air Force market on it, which was dropped <laughs> um, uh, a month prior to that, <laughs> back to, given back to us. And uh, uh, that is how we survived for the first two days till the build-up takes uh, took place. And uh, Tringomali, the ships landed, and uh, of course, uh, then all administrative uh, things were catered. But the first 48 hours, 52, 72 hours were tough. That's what this required. And there was no place to sleep. So we were virtually sleeping uh, in the open, uh, open to sky areas on the airstrip, on the side of the airstrip. We were just sleeping there only, uh, spending the nights like that. Uh, that was one. And then sometimes in the first week of August, uh, we moved from there to a place called Iyakachi next to the Elephant Pass. This was a big grove and the entire battalion concentrated and subsequently uh, two units moved out to different places from there, you know, spread out. And uh, that is how we dispersed. And uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the period between July and August, uh, was, and July, August and September rather, was uh, more of a political moves. You know, so many agencies were trying to now uh, get the money points uh, with the uh, higher ups. So actually at ground level, we, we knew nothing. We knew nothing. Uh, we had no maps, no 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 tr modern training aids, what GPS, right. etc. What we have as on today, like uh, today the army is far superior and very well equipped. Like uh, anyhow, we'll come to that later. So uh, we were just with our uh, weapons, which uh, personal weapons sort of thing, and uh, limited ammunition. And uh, of course, uh, the this is the time when uh, you know the build up. The accord that Prabhakaran was uh, virtually held up in uh, till 4th of August there in uh, Ash Ashoka Hotel. And he was not agreeing to this uh, accord. And um, will, you know, will he some pressures from the MGR and all? I think he agreed and he came back. But he has made up his mind that sooner or later we have to take on. And this, is, this accord is uh, not agreeable. 
and probably the uh, type of treatment which he was given was also not uh, to the desired level which you would have given after all he was a guest so that thing uh, he kept thing in mind and you know the the revenge factor in the militancy at a young age is very very hard you don't see the uh, repercussion you you are so young and uh, that passion is so high and especially if they have trained themselves so well we trained them rather and uh, they advanced their training with the plo with the mushad sir every one trained them over the years later on uh, once they got the basic training from us so um, that thing happened and uh, when they realized that you know so called accord one of the major clause was to laying down of arms they gave all those broken level barrels in the parliament which was no good for the even uh, to break a duck down Uh, so those type of weapons, they, they did all the, or rather they disused the things. They did a token sort of thing, and it was agreed. We thought probably they will uh, throw the line, but no, it didn't happen like that. Uh, and um, sometimes in September, 19th of September, 87, yes, when Taliban went on a hunger strike, fast on the death, it was pre-planned. Right. And uh, yeah, he was very motivated guy. I had seen the uh, Nalur uh, temple where he started the fast in uh, Jaffna. I'd I'd been there, and uh, on twenty third of uh, I think twenty third of September he passed away. He was a very weak guy otherwise physically. He's thin, slim, but determined guy. Like he remained on uh, hunger strike for quite some time, and he died. His death was uh, the first turning point. and uh, you know uh, where we were in camps i was uh, a place called kodi kamam uh, near chawa kachari with my company at that particular time and i remember very correctly that uh, before when all this thing when he was fast on the dead early morning uh, the uh, children ladies they come surround our camps and sit down right at the exit gate so we have one gate now we have to go take the water bowser to bring water so we could go so we told them listen we have to go out to draw water he says sir we are sitting without water you so you are also part of us you also be with that so days went when we were something like this but since uh, you know you couldn't do anything the kids or children they were though no men folk and they were in hundreds they were in hundreds they used to come and block our uh, camps and so is this type of yeah 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 of course of course but then we used to by evening you know we also go walk into the crowd and we said no this is the sin we are with you but uh, of course we are not against you but what has happened is uh, right and all so those things kept on going on that type of thing and we could make it out that the 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 the, the situation is uh, at the ground level is changing and uh, certainly not what it used to be in the month of august so that thing kept on building up and the build up and there was a utter confusion because you know the other agencies the central agencies were do whatever games they were playing or whatever uh, teams they were trying to apply were unknown to us we were totally focused on the military thing and the on ground we were related to, uh, relating to the people the tamil people there so it was a very different situation of course and uh, come uh, first week of uh, October when 17 of them were caught by the Indian Navy, you are aware. Yeah. And taking those top LGBT leaders, they were very, very the top. You know, they the total upper rank got caught, unfortunately. And uh, when they were taken to Palali, I feel, and of course that to be or not to be to Colombo, that thing kept on going, and how they were smuggled into the uh, cyanides and they consumed. That was the turning point. That was the last nail in the coffin. It. then they decided boy now we are going to take on and uh, we also realized because we were still lost our face and faith of course that little trust and what we have built up they said no 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 you guys have let us down you didn't save us uh, i mean things are very clear you know now it's a matter of time and within a week this thing happened so at that particular time one of our battalion of uh, our now the formation was in jafna fort one was at chinakam we were at palali so at we were asked to move out from palali to so our unit was the first one so uh, if you come out from uh, palali so it's, it's a place called chirankam where five madras was there so we went through five madras and the first battle which started was on the uh, 10th 11th of uh, 80 uh, october 87 at matnapuram okay so delta company it took us almost 48 hours to clear matnapuram 
uh, on way to Jaffna. And from there, we were directed to Manipai access. So we went to Uruville and uh, Manipai. We cleared Manipai. By then, we uh, have uh, virtually exhausted. Uh, we had very painful casualties. We had uh, almost by the, uh, by the time operations ended, we had uh, 23, 2, 1, uh, and 20 uh, other ranks uh, fatal casualties. Two officers, one GSQ, and 20 other ranks, and almost 79 wounded. So you can well imagine the intensity of operation in the first uh, three days. And uh, then on the 14th, 15th of night, uh, by then, uh, 12th of October, of course, the 41 Brigade, uh, which General Jones was explaining, which landed in Palali. And uh, we have by then uh, gone up to Manipai. We have cleared up to Manipai Axis, uh, which was almost about 12, uh, 14 kilometers from Palali. That area was, and uh, from there, one of our company went and was tasked to go to Anakotai. So Anakotai is uh, the, is on a coastal road uh, leading to uh, via Vadukatai, Manipai, Vadukatai, uh, Vadukatai to Chapna Point, and to make a firm make a firm base for 41 Brigade operation. Firm base is a place where till that area is cleared, and from there the troops, fresh troops, can be launched. Okay. So uh, that is under Major Ganpati, a Delta company went in. And uh, short of Anakarai, there's a milestone three on the coastal road where they were surrounded. They were surrounded. They were out in the open field and uh, daylighted in the morning. And a uh, very heavy volume of fire started coming all, from all the four, three, four directions. So they were in a paddy field. They took position in that paddy field. Right? And now it started raining, so they fought as much as they could. They had almost got eight to nine uh, fatal casualties. And, uh, they had to draw the bodies back, kept them there, keep them there. And um, they were running short of ammunition at this time. And uh, then our CEO, our commanding officer, <coughs> late Colonel Rati, he uh, asked uh, a patrol to move there to go and replenish the ammunition. Now, this was a very difficult task. So we had one young uh, Captain Sunil Chandra, uh, boy with about 40, he was joined us. In, yeah, about three years service. Uh, this youngster took about 12 odd guys and uh, they were totally loaded with ammunition. Right. Completely. Every pocket, pouches, Bags, packs, everything, and water bottle, nothing else. And they have to fight through. Now, it was very, very difficult. They had no navigational aid. They had no map. Fish talk, right? Compass bearing, you can't fight through holding a compass and keep fighting also. Okay. And there was no aid. So, this, this is a time when uh, one of our uh, right officers, who's left the army, of course, uh, who was doing the adjutant. <coughs> He says, Chandra, you go ahead. We are fighting the mortars. You follow the direction of the bomb. So he started firing the 81 millimeter mortars and, you know, started giving him a sort of direction. Uh, that distance about four kilometers was covered in almost about eight hours, nine hours. And first light, Chandra realized that he, he had, when he spotted the troops, he virtually crawled through the LTT perimeter through the paddy fields, all 12 of them, and they replenished the ammunition. And that was the time when the company was barely left with about eight to nine rounds of ammunition with the company commander and a few rounds with the men and a couple of grenades. That was the last of all. But hats off to the determination of the men under Major Ganpati, later colonel. Uh, they held on. LTT bought the vehicles and the loudspeakers. They said, we will treat you as for the Geneva Convention. You surrender. We will not harm you and everything. We will treat you well and all that bullshit. But nothing doing. The major fought his way till this happened. And once the ammunition was uh, received, of course, they were back to the... Uh, and in this particular time, when this thing was happening, Chandra got shot. So then uh, that is the time when after two, within two days, this uh, 14th, 15th, 17th, we lost Chandra, 17th of October. And uh, very next day, then uh, 19th, the 41 Brigade linked up with them. 
Okay. So then they, of course, moved towards Jaffna Port. So that was the first uh, sort of initial uh, days of operation till the first seven, eight days of operation. So it was very intense, let me tell you. Now, the problem uh, which we found was, uh, you know, uh, firstly was the language. Uh, we were from uh, Mahar troops or Marathi speaking men, and uh, we hardly had any people who could. But later on, uh, people from the engineers, the Tamil boys, they joined as interpreters. And that is how, when we spread, we, we dispersed uh, our companies uh, and we went into a CI grid. And then the normal CI operation started. The, the issue was uh, when we compare Sri Lanka operations today, uh, what happened in Kargil and all, uh, Kargil, you were having, uh, I mean, fantastic boys did wonderful work in Kargil. I mean, unbelievable, unimaginable type of uh, uh, valor, uh, display of valor was there in Kargil. And uh, so was in Sri Lanka, but two things. Kargil, you had all type of support. You could fire purpose, your helicopters, your aircrafts, everything went into it. Here, of course, Air Force and Navy was there, but they were more into the uh, logistics sort of thing. Air Force few helicopters and uh, our uh, AROP, they did a fantastic job in the evacuation, uh, air evacuation of the soldiers during this thing. But we, our weapon systems were restricted. You know, we were virtually fighting with small arms. Now, small arms with, uh, with rifles against AK-47s, G3, M16, are no match. Virtually right. no match, let me tell you. And... Uh, uh, we as officers, we, we were given a sten, uh, sten gun, and a sten gun has got a bloody range of 30 meters. Uh, and that too, after 30 meters, the velocity uh, loses. The, the, the bullet loses velocity, and uh, it's not very effective. I mean, it, you just scrape through and go. Yeah. But as far as, uh, but SLR, the self loading rifle, was the mainstay for us at that particular time. It was effective, it was deadly. And of course, then we graduated to the uh, lot of rocket launchers. Uh, LTD was very, very scared of rocket RLs. Okay. The, the major success of uh, para commandos was this because they had RL between every five men, one RL, which, and with, for us, it was between 35 people, one RL, right? Okay. And um, they were very scared of uh, the air busts. So when you have a type of uh, round which uh, goes in the air bust, it causes a lot of psychological as, as a physical uh, damage. So they were scared of that, and of course the he uh, eighty round uh, so that is has got a devastating effect. So by then the tanks and everything, remember, but they were virtually like it was not a tank uh, sort of terrain, tankable terrain because you're restricted to tracks. And uh, these guys, uh, they had a network. They had a network of IDs. Every hundred meters they had IDs, and the IDs were not small mines. There were 20 kg to 100 kg barrels full of RDX. And once blown off, like you, you're shattered psychologically. So before fighting, you are more worried about on the ground, is the ID around or the fellow in front. So you got to balance your movement. So we left moving on the tracks. Uh, when we started operating, uh, at least we developed our own drills. So if you have to go north, we knew they are monitoring us. Some odd guy sitting with us, just a walkie-talkie about 100 meters from the camp. He says, okay, troops are moving out towards this direction. So if you have to go towards south, we will go up north. From there, we will hijack a couple of vehicles and come down south from a different route to the place. So now you see where we could have to cover in half an hour. We have to work out four hours in advance to uh, surprise the guys. So we kept on changing, and that is how we threw them out from the pockets of Jaffna. It took us about good three to four months. And then they moved to jungles. Of course, their right. presence was still there, but not to that extent of group of 50 to 60 what they were initially holding and giving a pitch battle. So Jaffna clearance took place somewhere around about January to February 88, when we had a total domination, but still not safe. And that too with the influx and so many troops deployed on the grid that virtually every kilometer and a half we had a body of troops in between we were carrying out operations we developed our own 
ent network and then people also we, one thing is very good indian soldiers hats off to them they are too kind to the civilians we are so in spite of their no uh, you know uh, observer doing on human right to me but we were really like our own kith and kin you know so they they do. i mean I, i personally my personal experience my best of informers were the youngsters who were doing medicals or uh, the, the the i still remember uh, a guy who was uh, uh, head of the uh, economics department in jaipur university he walked up to me and one fine day he gave me some very very uh, good information which was surprising you know so that is how the troops deployed and uh, the grid system made it very very effective and uh, of course uh, it was more of a youngsters battle to be very honest all the company commanders uh, pradhan commanders in the cases I'll, i'll narrate a very fine incident we have one captain baliwal then second lieutenant okay. of course retired as a colonel later so he was deployed somewhere closer to jaipur university okay. right uh, please call kondavel temple so one fine morning he and subedar anna ganesh chari they took 10 men on a domination patrol in and around and uh, they you know random checks they, they found three guys coming on a cycle so they said tumhe inge va like the youngster kabhi so in spite the, those chaps they were carrying a school bag sort of thing in front and books in hand so they tried to pull out a gun they pulled out a case but before that the two swar alert baliwal and ganeshari the shot, shot the first guy who was trying to the other two guys ran away one got wounded he got him later now this chap died and we found one ak47 to grenade assign it capsule okay fine one militant kill period sit trip right. issued and informed next morning I, i i used to do my little workouts there and i used to go for runs when the road opening party was in place so uh, i found you know when uh, there is a morning in uh, you know when someone dies and they mourn the death they put this um, uh, paddy dhan dhan aap samajhte hain uh, the rice thing yeah, they yeah. hang it uh, they hang it upside down okay. and uh, you find back uh, black flags so i said what the hell the town is absolutely quiet otherwise morning you find school children going to schools and all colleges and slip bit of traffic and we won them msr the main supply route of jaffna uh, i was at uh, uruvil that particular time uh, so i i i said yeah what what's happening like why they so quiet and why this morning music you know that tong tong going on early morning ye hua kya that sitar wadan all over so i uh, called for those my i said what happened he says sir uh, yesterday the uh, lct leader has been shot So the and so this is the morning the death. I said, who's this leader? They said, you people killed one. Said, who's that? They said, he was the Jaffna commander. All right. So that is how we learned that what the guy was called Karai Kalit. He was a Jaffna commander. He got into that situation and Baliwal got him. So that is how we learned by then. Uh, you know, completely another. It, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So, but it was too late. Uh, breaking news. It was not a breaking news anymore <laughs> because it was one militant killed. Say that Sitrep has gone yesterday. So yeah. Next morning, it was a guy who killed. <laughs> like he has lost his impact. You know, you understand now. Right. So this is this is the type of things which happened, and not once, not twice. And uh, we 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 just we raided so many camps, and we discovered the pound of ram. And by the time we finished, we had. 88 weapons to accredit uh, the battalion person and uh, we can uh, i mean we, uh, so that is how every battalion i mean not only us but right. every battalion they contributed some way or the other and of course you know uh, is when you watch cricket there are certain slog overs certain bad overs certain good overs right so it it's something like this at times we suffered casualties at times we came scratchless with 100% success so this is part of the game you know uh, all operations can't be successful all operations can never be unsuccessful but yes uh, we the problem which we faced for initially was we had no intelligence we had no idea as to what type this is a type of uh, uh, you know uh, opposition which you are going to meet of course i agree i mean i'm telling you we had virtually no idea 
that this is a type of stiff opposition which will be. While they knew everything about us, they read us through and through because they were coming to us, but we were not, uh, you know, uh, and they never kept. And let me tell you, see, LPT, uh, they have a very fine system of, uh, when I got hold of a couple of leaders and interrogated them over the, over the time, and they became good friends, like we used to sit down, they started saying in my camp, and they, be, they became my best informers. They were my saviors. I survived because of a guy called Daya who remained with me for Daya. Daya was his name, LTT name. His elder brother was Captain Vishnu, who died fighting in Anakotai Major Ganpati. His elder brother, next brother, was Anasiri, whom we caught. And this Daya I caught. So he became like the entire family was with us. So he became, no, he tells me, like, and I asked, how do you guys train? And I mean, why so much of motivation factor in you guys? He says, sir, actually, when, if I'm from Jaffna, I'm not uh, allowed to operate in Jaffna, I'll be taken to Barikalova. My name is Daya. I may be Daya Chandran, but I'll be given a different name and I'll be only known by that particular name. So the guy, if I go to Barikalova, people don't know me where I come from. What's my actual name? That's a type of secrecy level they have. Then he says, the camps are deep inside. I said, why can't you take me up to that particular? He says, listen, the camps are about 10, 12 kilometers inside the jungle, dense jungles of Babuni and all. So I said, then how are they sustaining themselves? He says, okay, the tractor load of food comes through the hidden, uh, you know, those tracks and all, mm. uh, the secret tracks, uh, routes. And from point A, He's picked up by LTT Carter to point B. Handed over at point B to another guy who takes it to point C. From C to D and then to the main camp. So the guy doesn't, even the guy who is sitting at A and B and C, he doesn't know where the main camp is. So even if you catch him, I don't know. He did. So this is a type of secrecy they had. And uh, it was fantastic. And they were youngsters. And their way of selection and the cardo selection was very good. Like we in the army, okay, right, 10 men, 7 rifles, one ten gun. It's like uh, laid down, you know, uh, distribution of ammunition. There, they pick up the guy like, okay, they will put you firstly, they'll test you for overground work. Then they'll see how good are you, like he's actually motivated. And then within two years, if they find him, Fit to be in the arms carter, they pick him up, and your age should be around about 17, 18 at that particular time. Uh, and then they will move you out of the house. You can't stay there in your own house. You have to move to a different district. And when they give you a particular weapon, see the system. They'll give you a rifle, G3, M16, AK-47, a pistol, and there's okay, guys. They'll give you five five rounds each. So you fire five rounds of each weapon. They say, okay, this fellow has found, uh, fired the G6 uh, free rifle much more effectively. So they give you another five rounds, another 10 rounds, and they reconfirm their selection procedure. Yes, this guy is good in this particular weapon. So that weapon becomes your mm, primary weapon. Personal weapon, right? That is the weapon you are. Now, when you are open that particular weapon, they are given a different duty because then you go into the sniper mode. Correct, uh, right. okay. Take on from a, diff, uh, from a distance. The okay. guys who are fit enough, energetic, like, so those are with the AK-47s and all those things, right? right. So they had that selection procedures very, very well established. I got a, a guy called Rambo. His name was Rambo. Okay. okay. And when, uh, when we caught him and uh, when, of course, uh, when we tried to interrogate him, I could see, I haven't seen a more fitter guy in my life. Deep muscle rippling, starting from very shoulders to his biceps. Very fit. I was so happy to see this. And oh, how motivated he is. Three days he was the three he didn't break. And he tells me, he says, Major, you can do anything to me. You will not get even a grain out of me. This I'm telling you right. So I also right, see the indoctrination, the level of. Uh, I, said, yeah. I said, but he says, no, I won't. Speed it. We are now fighting each other, so I will not uh, betray my uh, part, uh, Carter and my party and my this thing. Mm. I will not. I refused. So four paras, uh, four, the four para battalion was close by, and we used to do the link patrol. So one fine day, a patrol came from four paras under a subedar sir. 
So they visited and um, they learned that there's a guy in custody with us. So it's a normal, you know, inquisitiveness. Oh, they can do that. Who's the guy? So this Subedar called Jat from Haryana. He came and he says, uh, the, the moment they made an eye contact, this chap Rambo lunged at him, his feet. Sangwan Saab, Sangwan Saab. So I said, Saab, do you know him? <laughs> yes, Saab. I had trained in Chakrata, this is the third post. Okay. So, see, the, he says, sir, I have trained him in Chakrata. So, there are type of things which, the way, they are not documented, they are not known. So, then I said, okay, he says, sir, you are not going to break it. You do anything. I said, I will make up very much. Okay, sir, you are not going to break it. And rightly so. After six, seven days, we handed him over to the... Uh, you know, center where they all were kept. So this is a type of people. The people who broke up, the, the guys who broke down and they, they, they gave information. They, so those are the type of things which happened. And uh, it was, of course, a very, very tough overseas operation. And right. It's a very, it was one of the toughest. And I think everyone did very, very well. Right. Unfortunately, it uh, somehow has not got the due which... It was. After all, the men are yours. The army is yours. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a national army. Right, you may be, the, the political parties keep on changing left, right, and center. It, it makes no difference to us. I mean, we are serving the constitution and uh, we will abide by it for the sovereignty of our country. We will continue like this. But yes, uh, I personally think that you, I mean, just giving to BBC, MBC is not the, uh, the uh, soldier, soldiers. You have to, like I tell you, we have a colonel, Colonel Amri. He was a major in Battle of Madhra He was the first one to be wounded. As a company, he was the advancing company commander. He got onto an ID. Till day, he stays in Gurgaon. There's so many splinters in his body. Till day. He, he's now 70 plus. Keeps saying, Oh, yaar, ek or katta. So, you know, what happens? The splinters have got embedded. Right. And your body has a mechanism. It doesn't accept a foreign body inside. So, over the years, it just keeps on putting it out. So, at a stage comes where he just, there was some value that is there. That's it. Like what we do is break our hair, here, there, or way, way. So, there is a side of a, there is a chap who got a bullet, it okay. went through the helmet and got embedded, AK 47. It got into his skull. Fortunately for him, the soldier of ours, I forgot his name, uh, Atavli. So, young soldier, barely a year and a half of service that time he had. And the bullet got embedded and he was evacuated. So, at the Madras uh, military hospital, they refused. This is no. It's a, such a delicate spot. If we remove, he'll suddenly die. So, let the bullet remain there. And for the next two years, it remained so till the body started pushing it out. And, you know, that issue. And that is the time when he was reoperated. Now, you know, living with a bullet jutting out of your bed, skull, it's, it's, it's a very different thing. Right, so sir. These, op right. these operations are different aspects altogether. Uh, right. Rebel. And uh, anything more in particular, I, 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 I by design didn't go to the, uh, you know, uh, workbook or this thing. This is what exactly is the ground situation. No, and pretty, pretty insightful, sir. And you have, uh, you know, also, apart from the battle and all that units that they that took, taking up the fire and the counter attack and everything. You know, th these things that you mentioned, obviously, I don't believe that in the best of the potential can ever be recorded anywhere, unless and until comes from a veteran. So it's a really, it's a, it was a privilege for me to be a part of the discussion and that knowing so much from you, that it's not just about the operation, but also the aftermath, once the operation has settled down. What happens after that, you know, the, the life then after. So it was really a privilege uh, having this insightful discussion with you. So anything else that you would like to add from your end? So no, I, I think it's very good. And it's time now that uh, we have started that uh, basically, you know, we are various agencies and uh, you being one of them, I think it should be brought to it. It's nothing else. It's, it's a, and let me tell you one thing. I just want to add something. This training. And I would call it on-the-job training, which we got, 
I could see in later part of my life, after that I went to Somalia, I commanded a uh, battalion in uh, Kashmir in operation during Kargil time also, when Kargil operation broke out. We, I was there with my unit, I was commanding the battalion. And in SAM, in uh, Ob Rhino, I was uh, there for the first one year I commanded there and then we moved to Kargil and then we got sucked into Ob Rakshik in uh, CI grid in uh, Kupwara. The training came very, very handy. And over the years, the young officers of today and in between, in the pre, uh, preceding decades, they modified. They improved upon it. Today, if we are holding on to Kashmir, let me tell you, it is basically the modified drills. The drills are so good. And fortunately, we have the best of equipment. Right. Today, we have an equipment that a militant sitting somewhere, you can pinpoint, you can find it out. You, I mean, you must have been seeing the tweet of that uh, dog, Excel. Oh, yes, right. right. So it's very right. trending, trending now. now. The type of things which have gone into, which were not there. So for us, it was, you know, man to man. I mean, one is now, I can't say like this. We have grappled with the LTT guys. We caught hold of them. Up, but things are evolving. Things are different. But things today are very, very different. Our boys are too good. The present generation, the youngsters are superb and we are very, very safe. And let me tell you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm third generation in the forge. My dad, my grandfather, we two brothers, all served in the forge, all retired, of course. They right. uh, parents no more. But the point is that this was one of the most wonderful organizations. I and I'd love to be part of it in my next birthday. Sure. So it's it's it, 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 it's it's a great organization and hats off to the uh, type of work. Unsung, unseen, most of the time. Most of the time. Right. And uh, thank you so much for the time and all all the inputs and the tales that we have narrated today, sir. It was a complete delight, and I hope this would really serve in educating the younger generation down the line, many years down the line now, when they would again, you know, listen to this interaction, so they would really get educated and their angles, and it, it was a mind-bending uh, interaction altogether because the documents that we read today are of a different opinion, and this directly comes from those who have been apart. So, it was really a pleasure, sir. Remember, truth is the first casualty in war. So, what <laughs> right, you see in documents, <laughs> what actually happens is, <laughs> on ground are two different. I mean, you can quote me on the subject, you are right. It makes right. no different sense. I mean, such for such, yeah, na? Reality so, is reality. Like right. it's 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 coming from a heart. I'm telling you, right. things that you when you when you are with soldiers, you don't think like the, the, you first thing first comes. Boys, these guys have to be safe, and that is what is military lead, young leadership right. all about. And it's I'm so happy. It's still following. Still, the youngsters are leading, and that's why the things are happening. Right, sir. Unlike the other organizations where the fights are pushed and policies are made. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much for your time and everything, sir. And uh, thanks, Babu. Yes, we have certain more stories to share sometimes later. Sure. Definitely, sir. Definitely.